Welcome back to another little mini session we have for you today. Uh, I was talking a little bit earlier and we had decided that this is the this is the first mini session that I've done in a long time. You always see me at the beginning and I'm just kind of chatting and introducing, but I haven't done one in a long time. So let's see if I can remember how to use Infinite Visions. It's been a year or two. Um, my name is Mike Martinez. This is the Maricopa County School Superintendent's Office coming to you live from our delicious podcast room of which I am the only one in here. It seems kind of odd, but kind of lonely today, but here I am. Thank you everybody for having your cameras on. I do enjoy seeing some faces now and then. Uh, as we talked a little bit earlier, some of you have discovered the video filters that go along with it. So feel free to have a little bit of fun while you're listening as I talk and kind of going through the wonders of vendor maintenance. So what I'm going through today, vendor maintenance, we're gonna be talking about uh, vendor maintenance and vendor cleanup, what you can get rid of, what you have to keep, We'll go into some other parts of vendor maintenance. We'll be talking about um, setting up proposed vendors. If you've ever seen the proposed vendors option and how that worked, uh, I will walk you through creating proposed vendors and getting that to work. Talk a little bit about use tax, setting up alternate payees, um, attaching documents, a little bit about 1099s, and the all important changing vendor addresses and changing order and remit addresses. It seems to be a big question. It always seems to come into our office. So if you wanna hold on a second here, I will go ahead and share my screen. All right, everyone should be able to share, should be able to see my screen. So go ahead and if you have your video on, go ahead and give me a big thumbs up. All right, so let's talk about Infinite Visions purchasing and payables vendors. So. First thing we want to go to, as you've kind of set up your new year and you do that first general ledger rollover, the first thing that happens is all your general ledger settings roll over and all of your accounts payable settings roll over. So all your vendors come over, all the items are set up. And then that way that allows you to start setting up POs, requisitions, and everything you need to, to get the new year started. Part of that is now you have the ability to kind of go in and you really get a chance to sort of look at your vendors and like, what can I clean out? When was the last time I used some of these vendors? What can I um, kind of narrow down all of this stuff that I have in vendor maintenance? So I'm going to go into vendors and I will show you a couple things here in vendor maintenance. And I'm just going to hit apply selection here. Oh, I will check a couple boxes here. So hold on. I'm going to hit show transaction totals and show calendar year to date totals. So these are totals only from the current year. So if you're doing this in FY22, you're not going to see any show transaction totals unless you've already started issuing requisitions for that year. And you will see calendar year to date totals because it will be calendar year today as of January 1st of this year. So if you've paid that vendor since January 1st, you're going to see calendar year to date totals. So I'm going to go ahead and it apply selection. I'm going to rearrange my grid a little bit here. So I am going to let's say instead of fax number, no, who uses a fax number anymore? Where is it? There it is. I'll take my vendor ID and we'll move us to the front. I'm going to take a vendor phone number because I don't care. Change that to when you add these new columns, they're usually right at the end. Oh, I will change, I will look at a payroll vendor. And Last voucher date. All right. So for cleanup purposes, the big columns I'm looking at here are, I'm going to look at the vendor ID. I'm going to look at the payroll vendor flag. And I'm going to look at the last voucher date. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to remove everybody that is a payroll vendor. Those need to be, those need to be handled separately from everything else that you look at in purchasing and payables. Simply because you don't want to accidentally remove a payroll vendor if they're still attached to a deduction and that deduction may be still kind of hanging around in your payroll thing. That is something you really kind of need to sit down with your payroll people and say, like, which deductions are we no longer using? Can we clear them out? Because there's such a chain of events that needs to happen to clear out a payroll vendor not even really going to go into that day. So I'm going to filter by selection, filter excluding selection, get rid of all my payroll vendors. The other thing I'm going to show you here is 
the vendor ID. So the nice thing about the vendor ID, and it's really kind of transparent as far as your day-to-day -day operations is concerned, but the vendor ID is unique for every vendor and it's assigned in sequence to every new vendor that you've added into the system. So if I go into vendor ID and I sort descending here, all my new vendors that I've created will be at the top and all my older vendors are gonna be at the bottom. So it's a quick and easy way to kind of determine how long a vendor has been in your system because there is no create date on a vendor record at all. It just doesn't exist. So you, you can have a vendor in here that could have been in there for years and years and years and years, but you can't tell because it looks indistinguishable from every other vendor that you have. So it's a nice way if you're looking to clear out some older vendors or maybe you have some inactive vendors in here. So if I sort this the other way around, sort ascending, I can see all my old vendors here. And these are the ones that's usually set up right in the right, right from the get-go. So these are the ones that you probably have used a lot over the years. But as you kind of reach middle here, ah, never mind. I did filter by active vendors. I'm gonna do all vendors. Let's change this up a little bit here. All righties, sort ascending. And I'm gonna remove my payroll vendors again. So I see a couple of inactive vendors in here that are super old. And you may wonder, it's like, can I, can I clean these out? Do I need to carry these around? When was the last time I had SNH Uniform Corporation? When was the last time I paid them? Here's a nice other little feature that's in here. The last voucher date probably implemented, I want to say somewhere around 2015, 2016. So any voucher, any purchasing and payables voucher that was issued for that vendor, it's going to put the date of that voucher in the vendor record as the last voucher date. So if I'm looking through here and I see something that's blank, I know for a fact that I have not paid that vendor since at least 2015. If they are inactive, there is absolutely no reason for me to keep them around in here. I can go ahead and delete them out. So I'm going to filter by inactive. I'm going to look by my last voucher date and I'm going to filter by a clear last voucher date. So I know on my screen now, I now have a list of all inactive vendors that I haven't used since at least 2015. In that case, I can just highlight a bunch of them. And delete. Now, the cool thing about this is this only deletes these vendor records in the current fiscal year that you are working on. If so, if for some reason you need to go back into history and see, oh, well, when did I have this vendor? When did I use this vendor? You still have access to all those old years that you can go in, you kind of pull up that vendor history information on there. There's just no reason for you to be carrying around a vendor that you haven't used for at least five or six years. So I'm gonna go ahead and delete these records in here. And then I would just go through this process and start removing all of those inactive vendors if there's no voucher date. Now items with a voucher date and items that are, have this active flag on there, those are going to, you're going to want to take a little more care into using. Um, some of my voucher dates on here are pretty old because this is a training database. We've actually had this for a couple of years. So I believe the most recent voucher in here is from 2018. You're going to have a lot more up-to-date information. I logged into a couple of districts just to kind of verify that that date is still in there. It is still in there and it's still working exactly as, def, uh, exactly as designed. So go ahead, start removing all the items out by that last voucher date. The other option you can look at is if you had somebody that was added this year, and if you want to kind of go back and see when that was added, you can actually look into the change log for vendor maintenance and any item where you get added a new, um, a new vendor name or new order name, those are usually the first created times for those particular vendors. So if I go into here, master train, and if you've never been into the change log, it is a nice little tidbit of information. Now we'll go into data type, vendors. I'm just gonna hit apply selection. So the change log is only for items that happen within the current year. You will not see those, some, of, some of those change items pop up. All right, 
So in here, I can see a lot of mass changes in here, all those mass changes. I'm gonna filter out those mass changes. Uh, I think I filtered the wrong way. I don't know if my mouse button is clicking right. I have a very embarrassing thing to share with you. I lost my dongle. Um, and I'm talking about the dongle that attaches to my mouse and keyboard. So now I'm using this crappy little Bluetooth mouse and sometimes it doesn't work the way I want it to. So uh, and I ordered a new one, but it hasn't come in yet. So it acts a little bit funny sometimes. But you can go into the change log and you can see the items that have changed for a vendor. And that will give you a, a, closer, a, a closer picture, at least for the current year, as to when a particular vendor was added or when a particular vendor was um, last updated. And the question came across, if I delete out of 2021, will it delete out of 2021, 22? So my question to be is, why would you go back into 2021 and delete them at all? Uh, I would just I would just go forward and delete them out of 21, 22. But to answer your question, no, it will not. So if you delete them out of the current year, they will still remain in the in the, in the new year. But I would clean up in the new year. Always clean up going forward. Never clean up going backwards. All right. So go back into vendor maintenance. Just remember. The, the other big thing, one of the reasons I had to remove the payroll vendors from this particular screen is payroll vendors do not have a last voucher date associated with them. So even though you look at it here, it's like, oh, there's no last voucher date on this payroll vendor. I'm going to go ahead and talk to them about removing this out. Well, chances are this is, this is something that's already being used. Um, and that last voucher date is only for purchasing and payables vouchers. Even deduction vouchers aren't included in there. Payroll vouchers aren't included in there. So it's not only going to show last voucher date for purchasing and payable vouchers. So just be very careful about that. Like I said, remove that payroll vendor out of there first. That way you don't screw it up, especially if you have a lot of garnishment vendors, because garnishment vendors look like normal vendors. They're not like hit you over the head, Arizona State Retirement, the Internal Revenue Service. They're not stuff like that. They're, you know, AA title loans and things like that. You know, stuff that like, oh, I, I can see, you know, some of them you might actually do business with. So. Just make sure you're taking care not, not to remove the first thing. It will try to stop you if you have anything currently tied to that vendor. So if you have a requisition or a PO or something in the current year that is tied to that vendor, it's not going to let you delete it. Um, like I said, there is a sort of cascade effect that happens when you start removing stuff out of this. So it will only let you do it if there's nothing, nothing attached to that vendor right now. So you're kind of saved a little bit. So let's talk about... Any questions on removing vendors out? It's super easy and, and it still surprises me to this day how many vendors a district will actually carry around in their vendor maintenance. Maybe they put them in at one time and you never actually use them or you, you, know, you, had, a, you know, had a stack that maybe you went on a field trip eight years ago and you haven't used since then. There's a lot of stuff in there that you can clean out. And the cool thing about Infinite Visions is that you can always go back to those old years and see those vendors in there. But there's, there's no point in muddling up your vendor maintenance with thousands and thousands and thousands of vendors if you don't actually use them. All right, cool, no question. So let's talk about another new feature. Well, I say new to me because I haven't used it at all and kind of tinkering around with this, I kind of, um, yes, there is a column for PR garn for PR garnishment. So not only is it for garnishment, um, garnishment records, there is a, payroll vendor flag, and there's a PR garnishment flag. So your, your double warnings to not delete those ever. Um, guaranteed those are gonna be around for the long haul here. So another thing I wanna talk about is setting up a proposed vendor. And I don't know if anyone's, use, it's, if anyone's using a proposed vendor, go ahead and drop us a line in the chat. Uh, let us know, I'd like to, like to know how it works out um, in practice. But if you're interested in using a proposed vendor, here's kind of a breakdown of what it does. So you have what, what is essentially a vendor record template in your vendor maintenance screen. And you, sign, you assign that record and you designate it as a proposed vendor. And then when you have requisitioners, when you have requisitioners that are out on sites or in the district office and you get new vendor information, to speed up the process of creating that requisition and getting that flow going, you can sign it so that your requisitioners actually have the ability to submit a proposed vendor 
And then when it gets to a certain point, someone can authorize that proposed vendor and it will actually write that vendor information into vendor maintenance for you to kind of speed up the process. So you don't have to wait, hey, I sent this off to someone in finance to create the vendor record and then you wait and you wait and you wait and then there's, this, you know, the rec gets slowed down. You can speed up that process by using a proposed vendor record. So what you can do is create a proposed vendor record. So give me a moment here. I'm gonna add a new record and I will create one and I'll just say 000 proposed vendor. And I have to put something in here because it is required. So I'll just put periods in here. And then 602-555-1212. Everybody knows that number, contact email. And then you have to use the option. There is at the bottom here to the right-hand side, there's a little checkbox that says proposed vendor. So you have to make sure you select the proposed vendor flag. Close this dialog after update and click OK. Oh, didn't like my email address. I didn't like that email address either. Click OK. So now if I go back, I sort, I now have what is essentially a vendor template in vendor maintenance. So how does this work in practice? So let's close vendor maintenance here. I'll go into our training database and I'm gonna go into control panel and I'm actually gonna create a requisition. Now, if you happen to watch our session a couple of days ago where we talked about requisition and approval and stuff like that, um, I would just like you to know that what I'm about to show you, I tested prior to the point when they went in there and changed all the approval routing. So hopefully they haven't screwed it up to the point where I can't do this. So I am gonna go ahead in here and the vendor, if I hit this, I'm the first one in my dropdown list is gonna say 000 proposed vendor. That's that proposed vendor and put it in there. And the reason I named it 000 is that because it pops up on the top of the dropdown list whenever I go into this screen. So there's no mix up. They don't have to search for it in a list or anything like that. It's just proposed vendor. So I'm gonna choose proposed vendor. And the moment I do that, this tab appears at the top, this proposed vendor tab. And if you don't believe me, let me change this. Disappears, appears. So there's my proposed vendor information. And I'm just gonna create a quick requisition here. Oh yeah. So it's gonna make you put in proposed vendor information. And these are essentially, these are all the fields that you have in vendor maintenance, they are just in a condensed screen here on the requisition screen. So I'm gonna add something in here. Let's call it, um, road microphones, one, two, three. Okay. And we'll add a line, say. And while he's adding that, we do have a couple of districts that did say they do use it and they have used it and it works very well. So just want awesome. to put it out there. Give me an account number, Jill. 001, 100, 1000, 6610. And then you can pick, yep, that works. Tab right out. Works. Tax, no freight. Also, there was a comment about the amazing showing them how to delete vendors. Somebody has like 3,000 vendors that haven't been used since 2014. So just so you know, it works. Just <laughs> mass delete you know. all of that crap. All right. right. So now I have my requisition set up. I have my, I have a tie to my vendor template, proposed vendor. I put in my proposed vendor information and I am going to go ahead and click submit for approval. Click OK. Boom, now it's in the approval queue. So now I'm gonna close out of the control panel, go in my purchase requisition screen. Oh, see, all right. In my purchase requisitions, 
in my purchase requisition screen, not only do I see the requisition I put in here, I see that it's currently tied to 000 proposed vendor. If I go up to actions, where, oh wait, no, it's, sorry. In the requisition itself, and this is in the purchase requisition screen, under actions, there is an item in here that says accept proposed vendor. Now you have to have use of security to use this. I'll show you that in just a second. But if I hit this accept proposed vendor, and I'll go ahead and do it here, you can see it changed the vendor name from 000 proposed vendor to Rode Microphones, which is actually the brand of microphones we use here now. Click OK. Now, if I go back into my vendor maintenance screen, right here at the top is my brand new vendor that I had submitted through, prop through proposal. It actually writes that vendor record into vendor maintenance for me, assigns it a vendor ID, sets everything up for me, and I still have my 000 proposed vendor record in there. So the next person who needs to propose a vendor can go ahead and put that in there. So it's a great way to sort of speed up that process of using the proposed vendor. Again, you have to do it. You have to have somebody set up to accept that proposed vendor. But once you do, it does help in streamlining that process. So let's jump down and take a look in user security really quick. I wanna show you the security option. And this is again, one of those things that you would only have a limited number of people that with the ability to do. So the people that would normally be in charge of entering your, entering your vendor record, they, were, they would typically be the ones that's gonna set up to accept the proposed vendor. So I'm gonna go into my user security section. And if I look in here, there, let me see if I can find it. Ah, right here in the middle. There is a little checkbox in the middle here. It says, accept proposed vendor. Once that item is turned on, whoever has that particular checkbox can actually go into that purchase requisition, create a new vendor off a proposed vendor uh, without having to go in there and manually entering it. So it does two things. One, it, like I said, it streamlines that process. And two, it takes some of the workflow and data entry work off of whoever's entering all your vendor maintenance stuff. Still, there's still things that you might want to follow up on, like, if it requires a W-9 and you need to get a W-9 from that vendor, or if you need to get some other sort of contract information or you know, quote from that, you still have to go through those process. But at least the groundwork is laid there for you and you can still move forward while the requisition is kind of sitting there. So it, does, it will help you speed up that process a little bit. So hopefully you get to use that because like, it's really kind of neat. Definitely worth the time to go ahead and set up. All right, any questions about the proposed vendor? So far, no, we're good. All right, cool. <clears throat> that's kind of the downside of being in this room by myself. I don't have anybody here to kind of- We do have a quick question. What if you do not want to accept the proposed vendor? Uh, you would kick that requisition back. Right, return it back to you. Back to the originator and say, no, thank you, try again. So, so if they're putting in a rec and say, hey, you know, I want to buy from ABC company, which they just happen to own or something. Um, and you're like, no, we're going to use, you know, CDW or we're going to use Amazon or whatever. Kick that back to the original and have them redo it. Um, and if you're interested in how that works, did an awesome session about it two days ago. That video is now available on YouTube if you want to take a look at it and how to kick back those requisitions. Oh, it's Cheryl awesome. came up. You can also change the vendor name during approval. I was not aware of that. That's, that's also a nice feature, especially since I know that a lot of people I work with sometimes can't type. Not saying no names, Jeff. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about some of the other things within vendor maintenance that you might be able to get some use out of. Um, I'm gonna skip over use tax for now, but I wanna go back into vendor maintenance. And another question that we've gotten it pops up every now and then, but the ability to use an alternate payee within the system to pay off like a purchase card uh, payment. So say, for example, you have a P card through Wells Fargo 
and you buy something on Amazon, you put the requisition to buy it off of Amazon, but you paid for it with your P card through Wells Fargo. How do you set that process up in Infinite Vision so that when the check comes out, you can actually turn around and pay that towards your Wells Fargo card instead of making a check towards Amazon? Easy to set up actually. In vendor maintenance, I'm gonna open this up and I actually have a Wells Fargo credit card here. So I'm gonna open this up. And it's set up very similar to all your other vendors. You'll have all the other flags set up here. The difference is gonna be on the e-procurement information tab, which is right in the bottom in the middle. You click that. On the bottom, there is a little check box here that says P card slash EFT payee. This is something that you will really only have if you use one EFT payments out of Infinite Visions. Um, if you're hosted by a county office, you're not using this, I can tell you. Uh, but if you have a purchase card or you are using the EFP bin, you would set that checkbox on and I'll show you how that works right now. And that also checkbox comes into play if you have a AP processing company like Commerce Bank, something like that. Yes, yes. Which we do allow on our county people. Yes. All right, so I'm gonna go into my control panel again and I'm gonna create another requisition. Actually, no, I'm not going to create a record. I'm going to go ahead and just skip all the way to the invoice. So I'm going to go to the invoice processing. Where am I? That way, the people who's entering the requisition don't really need to know some of the, some of the intricacies about what's going on behind her. So but I'm going to come into invoice processing. So say I'm creating my invoice, and I'm going to add a new invoice. Invoice comes in pick out the PO number. So Smith Rentals, we bought some stuff from Smith Rentals. They didn't take a PO. They didn't take a check. They said, we'll take your card though. So I'm going to choose Smith Rentals. We bought some stuff from them. Over here on the right-hand side, there's a little drop down. I'm going to hit this box and there's an option for any, any vendors that currently have that alternate payee or EFT flag turned on. So if you use EFT, you'd use an EFT vendor. This one, I'm gonna use Wells Fargo credit. I will select that. Now, what happens when I go ahead and do this and I create this invoice and I pay this invoice, when the check spits out of the system, that check is gonna be payable to Wells Fargo credit card. It will not be payable to Smith Rentals. So if I pay for my Wells Fargo card, it's gonna come out on a check for Wells Fargo. I'll turn around and send that off to Wells Fargo or pay that whoever, however I need to pay that. Um, but as far as vendor payment history is concerned, that payment is tied to Smith Rentals. So there's the bonus you get to kick on. You get to pay it like however is convenient for your district to pay it, but the vendor history and the payment history associated with that is always gonna be tied to the original vendor. It's just the check is gonna become the, gonna be made out to somebody different. So that's how you set up those alternate payees. Oops, let me accept my detail amount. Oh, all right. So I'm going to just cancel out of here because I don't want to go in through user security. Um, I yeah, do not. <laughs> that's been one we used the other day. So we've already paid stuff on it. <laughs> hey, thank you. Thank you for blowing away all my, all my options here, you guys. I really appreciate that. All right. So hit cancel on here. Um, again, when that check comes out, it's going to be made out to Wells Fargo. So that should hopefully make your life a little bit easier. All right. Moving on. Any questions on that? I'm hoping you guys are at least using that option. Um, the PCARD payee, is, it's actually been in the system for quite some time now. And I do remember recently within, a, I would say the past couple of months, somebody asked me how to set that up and it's really easy to do. So there's, if you have a PCARD um, and you're using it, it's definitely worth the time to set up. So I'm gonna close my screens here. I know there's an easy way to do this, but I'm, I'm so old school, I'm sorry. Habits die hard. Okay, so it's already March something, March 26th today. So you've already done your 1099s for the year, but I will take a quick look at it. Uh, if we go into vendor maintenance, I know you've done this already um, because if you didn't, you, you did not file taxes this year. So, so you may have a problem. But if I, in vendor maintenance, 
under 1099 information, I do want to point out some information on here. Uh, first of all, the 1099 box, that changed with the new update. So it's either going to say NEC or MISC. Uh, most everyone you have is all going to be NEC1. Uh, there are still cases and instances where you might generate a miscellaneous um, at a school district, but those are going to be few and far between. As a general rule, everything is going to be NEC1 from here on out. The other things I do want to kind of point out is, first of all, they're flagged as a 1099 vendor. Um, you have to have a tax ID or social security number, one or the other. Either one's got to be in here. But the other option in here is this name line one and name line two. So these are entirely optional. It happens to be filled in for this, and that's perfectly fine. But what happens is when the 1099 is generated, by default, it's going to go with whatever the order information is on this vendor. So if I created my payment information, I had I bought something from AT Lewis Plumbing, and I generated a check and everything, it comes out to AT Lewis Plumbing. If I generate a 1099, if I want it to come out to something different than AT Lewis Plumbing, you could put that information down here in your vendor name line one and line two, and this will actually print on the 1099 instead of the order information that is on the vendor. So in this case, the 1099 is gonna to go to the person's actual name, AT Lewis, um, I can't yeah. remember. There's the same the same as um, so the name is actually kind of kind of come out to that person instead of AT Lewis plumbing. So there's your there's your 1099 difference. It is not required. You could leave that blank and it will print out to whatever the vendor order name is on the 1099. It's not required at all. You're really only going to use it in situations like you see it with small businesses or, or single business owners where they're going to have the 1099 maybe generated out to a different name than what the actual payee is. Uh, it should be pretty similar, but just make sure you, you kind of have that. I have seen districts as a habit sort of fill this stuff in every single time. Uh, that is a waste of time. Um, unless you have a specific instances that require your, have, you to have a separate 1099 name on there than it is to check, you have no reason to fill that up. So leading in from 1099s, there's another little piece of information that you kind of need to know about. And let me find information. All right. So there is the checkbox on here for W9 received. And we had uh, we had a little conversation in office and and it might not, it might have been remote. I honestly I don't remember, Jill. Um, but we had a little conversation about what should be proper 1099 processes for school district. What can we recommend for 1099 processes? And we I, I'm aware that some districts require 1099, or sorry, W9 updates every year. Um, or every two years, or every three years. Uh, it, it really doesn't matter. The question is, how do you track those 1099s? What are you doing and, and how often do you do it? So first of all, let me let me put this out here. Um, why do I keep saying 1099s instead of W9, W9s? Because uh, it's all nines. I know, there's so many nines going on here. It's been a long week, okay? Um, so how do you track that W9 information? So first of all, let me tell you, W9s do not expire. And they, they, they may change, but they do not expire. The IRS does not care if you last submitted a W9, a W9 five years ago, if that W9 information is still correct. And when I say correct, it means the name is correct and the taxpayer ID is correct. That's it. The IRS could care less. Um, districts as a habit or businesses as a habit like to make sure that they update this every year, every two years, every three years. But when it comes down to it, uh, if someone doesn't send you a W-9, uh, it's not going to change anything. It's not going to change how the IRS feels about the situation uh, unless that information is no longer correct. That being said, you still want to kind of update. You still want to hey, reach out and say, hey, is all this stuff still correct? Because business has changed. Names will change. Um, so to make sure, there's this little 1099 box on here. Uh, it sucks. That's the only thing it does. You can check it or you can not check it. <laughs> And beyond the first time that you do anything, it doesn't change whatsoever. So how do you keep track of 1099s? Well, W9s. We have, we have God dang it. W9. <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> Let me write myself a note here to put W9s on the board. Um, <laughs> I'm going to change all of this stuff post-process. Don't worry about it. And when the video comes out, it's all going to say W9. <laughs> um, so 
How do you track those W9s? Well, there's no way to track W9s in here right now. None. Other than the checkbox, there's no way to track yeah. it. But there is a way to build that tracking in. So I'm going to cancel out of here. I'm gonna, actually, I'm going to stay here. I'm going to show you where. You can create a user-defined field to track your W9 information. You can also create a purchasing and payable document type and actually scan that W9 into the system. You can turn the system and, and manipulate in such a way where you can track all that information in here without ever having to go to a file cabinet in the back of your district warehouse somewhere where all the spiders and all the rats live. You do that all within Infinite Visions and you do that from the comfort of your own couch. So I'm gonna cancel out of here and I'm gonna show you how we're gonna set this up. Now, I realize a lot of you are not gonna have access to some of these areas and that's okay but I am telling you where to find those areas. So when you go back and you look at this video later and you go to your finance director or you go to whoever's running security at your district and say, hey, I need to add this particular field in this area. You can speak to them intelligently and say, click here, do this, do that. And then it just get, and hopefully it just get done. So I will scroll on down to security, workflow configuration, and there is an option in here for user-defined fields. So I'm gonna go ahead and drill into there. These are all the user-defined fields for everywhere within Infinite Vision. So you're gonna see stuff in here that's tied to payroll, employee maintenance, contracts and stuff like that. Ignore all that. We're just worrying about our vendor stuff. So I'm gonna add a new user-defined field. And the type, I'm gonna go vendor maintenance. The name of this field, I'm gonna say W9 date. The data type, I have three types. You can just plain text. So if I just wanna type anything I want in there, uh, I can have a drop down, like a yes, no thing or different options, depending on, on whatever was, was the situation you find. I'm gonna use date. Close this dialogue after update and then click okay. And then wait. It does take a second because there's some stuff that's going on in the background as it's updating and creating those fields. Um, that's why it's kind of taking a little bit. So don't worry, it's not you, it's me. All right, so I'm gonna go back into vendor maintenance now. Yeah, fine, <clears throat> loving guy. Now the 1099, so say I send out a request, can you update your 1099s? Our W9. W9. <laughs> when that W9 comes back in, I can go into user-defined fields. And now within user-defined fields, there is a W9 date. And I can choose the date in which that W9 was received and click OK. And I just want to add two cents. When you're creating that field, there was a, a box that was required. Because you guys don't use those user defined fields, consider if you require it, nobody will be able to leave vendor maintenance without filling in that date. So, yes, you should use require the required option should very rarely, if ever, be right. used because there's more times that you would leave it blank than you would ever put something in there for Correct. almost all instances. Mm -hmm. um, unless you were doing like a, like a, if it was like a contract thing and you required someone to check this box, if they agreed to whatever, that is the only instance in where you would do a required option. Um, most of it, you'll just kind of leave blank. And I will tell you that uh, once you put in a user defined field, it is there forever, 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 and ever. Forever, 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 ever, forever, ever. Right. Um, it will be there. Your grandkids will be using the user defined field <laughs> that you have created today, that's how long it will be in there. Um, right. Just keep that in mind. So don't, that's not something that you kind of want to go in there and play with unless you really, really kind of sure that that's the functionality you want. If you're not sure, create it in a provisional database, create the user defined fields, play around for a little bit, see if that's something that you really want to do, then go ahead and put it in production and then you'll be okay. So I'll put in my user defined field information, click okay. And now, since it is a user-defined field, it does show up in the grid. So now that is a sortable and viewable grid item in vendor maintenance. So I can track, hey, I have all my W9s coming in right now. Who do I have? Who am I missing? Who do I need to follow up with? So I can say my W9 date, 
my 1099 flag, my W9 flag, and just kind of go through and kind of see what am I missing? Who do I need to follow up with and who do I need to harass? The other thing you can do is you can actually, if I highlight that same, I did get my W9 back, go up to actions, go to manage documents on this particular vendor. I can add a scanned copy of that W9. So if they send it back to you like via PDF or something, turn around in Infinite Visions, add a new vendor document, click on document type, looking down this list here, well, I'll be damned. Out of all the stuff in, we have in here, there is no W9 document type. How convenient. I'm gonna exit out of vendor maintenance, go into purchasing of payables, configuration, PMP document types. Open this up. These are all sort of free forms sort of added in here. So I'm gonna add a new record in here for W9. Now that I've added that in that screen, I'm gonna go back into vendor maintenance, highlight my plumber, actions, manage documents, I'm going to add a new record. And in here, there's my W9. I will get my attachment. And I do have it on my computer here somewhere. There, W9 form. Close this dialog after update. And now it traps this document in with this vendor forever. Okay, so if I update the 1099 going forward and say just fiscal year 26, you're coming up and you get a new W9 or maybe next year you get a new W9, you come in here, you can clear out the old one, put in the new one and just update that document going forward. So I'm gonna click okay. And now that I've added this document, I'm gonna open up my plumber again. And it's kind of a crap place to put it. And, and I've kind of just, I've kind of discovering that Tyler likes to put useful stuff in the most hidden way possible. Uh, if you were on Wednesday, we talked about the little bit about the, the paper clip that's almost practically hidden on the vendor, on the, uh, on the requisition screen. Well, there is a little document sort of uh, spyglass or magnifying glass down here. Maybe you can see it if you zoom in. I'm gonna go ahead and click this. This icon only shows up if you have documents attached to that vendor. So if you've never seen this before, don't worry. It just means you haven't attached anything to them. So now that I have this here, I'm gonna go ahead and click on my little magnifying glass. There's my document type, double click on this. Oh, it apps automatically opens it up and I just apparently have not signed into Adobe on here. And here's the, oh, come on now. Here's the W9 information. Obviously I would already have this all filled out. This is just a blank W9 from the IRS. Uh, but it does show the current W9 that was attached to that render record and is attached to it going forward until you remove it or update it at some point. So even when you roll over into the new year and you roll over in a year after that and a year after that, these documents will follow that vendor until you remove the document or update the document. So it will always be there. And it's certainly way better than going back into the deepest warehouse of your school district fighting off the spiders and fighting off the mice and the rats and whatever it is you have living out in your area of the town um, to get that information. And it's right there. All right. Oops, I hit okay again. I didn't mean to do that. I do want to talk about one last thing here. Cancel. Okay. So what happens if a vendor changes address or changes their vendor name or has a new PO box? ADE is famous for this. I've never seen a business have more PO boxes than ADE for some reason. IRS, at least everyone uses like the same one or two PO boxes, but ADE seems to have a freaking box for everything. So how do you manage things like that? Or how do you manage things like when you have a vendor and maybe it's AT Lewis Plumbing today, but maybe next week they've decided to change their name or maybe somebody bought them out and maybe they're, I don't know, Billy Bob plumbing. So how do you change that? I'm gonna open up this vendor record. 
and it's grayed out here right now. So I can't just come into this record and change this because there's already history associated with it. There's already something tied to this vendor record because once it's used, you can't update this information anymore. That's why it's grayed out. So how do you change it? How do you change the, uh, this information for the name that just paid out? So I'm gonna come in here. There is an option for additional order addresses an additional remittance address. So I'm gonna change my remit address, say um, Billy Bob up has just bought out this guy. Specializing in plumber's crack. Oops. Oh. Same address. I used before. Now who has trouble typing? Right? It's because I don't have my dongle. Thank you for <laughs> pointing it out. All right. The other option you need to make sure that you do is if you if you type the name, you update the name, you're like, hey, you're not done yet. You have to scroll down to the very end and you have to check the box that says active. If you do not check the active box, you're not going to be able to do this next thing. So I'm going to make this active. Click OK. And you can do this with the order address as well. Just going to blow through the change log. So now that I have my additional remit address, I'm going to highlight the vendor record in the screen, go up to actions, and there is an option to set primary address. Click that. And my vendor record here. Oh. If I had an additional order address, it would give me the option of which order address I want to swap out. But I just want to swap out the remit address. Ideally, I should have done both, but I didn't because I was lazy. So if I hit this vendor remit address, there's the active. It will only show you the ones that I selected for active. So if you have ones that are no longer active, you can kind of tick those off. I'll select Billy Bob Plumbing. Click OK. Vendor record has been updated. So now if I go into my vendor record, I'm going to have a different remit name, then I have my order name. So again, this is something you would typically do both at the same time, uh, but that's how you swap out the name. So now from going forward, this company, which is the same company and may, you know, may have the same tax ID and that, that's, the, that's the kicker right there. Is the tax ID changing? Is, is the company significantly changing in any other way? Should you create a new vendor record? or should you create additional remit address or mission, additional order addresses? You kind of have to decide what the, how big the difference is between there and whether it's worth consolidating into one record. Minor name change or minor thing like that, go ahead and swap out the address or maybe they just moved and come in here and just update the address and everything. Or maybe they had just a minor name change and go in here and swap that out. Um, but that's how you swap out that information. So that way you're not creating new vendor records all the time. You just update the old vendor records to retain that information. And here's the cool thing about that. It maintains that vendor history. So when you do this sort of swap, it maintains that vendor history. So maybe tomorrow I make a requisition for Billy Bob Plumbing and I want to see, well, how much have I paid to Billy Bob Plumbing? Well, it's going to show the entire history from the time that it was A.T. Lewis Plumbing to Billy Bob Plumbing to whatever happens to come next maintains all that stuff in your vendor history report and all your 1099 information. So you don't have to go back in time and you don't have to look through the notes. Oh, well, they're new, but they changed their name and you look them up in a vendor record. Forget all that crap. All that stuff is managed within Infinite Visions for you is if you use it correctly. There's the kicker. Um, and that's probably one of the bigger questions that we've ever gotten on purchasing and payables is how do I change the address on a vendor because it's grayed out. Well, there's ways to do it. And again, the big key that usually ends up missing that, that people forget about is at the end of this record here, there is this little active checkbox. And if you don't scroll all the way to the end and see that active checkbox, it's not going to work for you. You'll have some problems. All right. Any questions? No. Good so far? Do you want to touch on why it wouldn't allow me to change that? Why it wouldn't allow you to change? But if you than, have invoices that are in process? Yes, yes. So if you have something that's in queue already for this vendor um, that hasn't been completed and you have to have everything for this vendor needs to be at, at a at already paid or already completed status, then you can change it out. Don't swap it out mid, mid range or, or in the middle of an invoice or in the middle of requisition PO. Wait till the end. 
do it for the next one um, or back everything out and do it for the, for the current one. That's, that's really the only reason you do that. And that's really just kind of protect everything to make sure everything still ties in and right. you're not swapping out vendor information halfway through the process. So for example, you don't want somebody to start a requisition for AT Lewis plumbing, but the invoice comes out to Billy Bob plumbing and then your auditor comes in and looks at this and like, what the hell happened here? You know? Um, you do have a question. Yes. There's a question out there. Will the new address come up for the new rec? So if I created a new rec, yes, it would. So what? Yeah. Oh, I did. Uh, let me, let me, see, I knew I was going to regret that. So hold on, let me go back in here. I'm going to change the order address as well. I'm typing on my laptop keyboard, so it's making it a little more difficult. Turn on the active flag. I'm gonna swap this out really quick. Now you see, if you looked on the grid, that vendor disappeared off my list because it resorted. In fact, it's gonna be in here under Billy Bob Plumbing again. But if I go into MC Master Train and I go to create a requisition, and if I hit this drop down, Billy Bob, Billy Bob Plumbing is in there. Has my address in there my new primary address, I'm all ready to go. So everything is fixed going forward. Um, but again, all that vendor history remains uh, with the prior information. So I can always look back to see kind of what happened there. Any questions? Yeah, look good. Awesome, awesome. Well, everybody, that's all we have for kind of vendor maintenance cleanup and kind of get some new things for vendor maintenance. Hopefully you learned a couple new things. If not, it's always good to have a refresher and it's always good to see your smiling face out there. So uh, thank you for joining me today. Uh, hopefully you all have your uh, COVID vaccine. Uh, I think we're at a point in our office here where almost everybody has either already been sick or already had the vaccine. There's maybe one or two people and I'm waiting for them to kind of uh, look the other direction and I'm going to go around the office and just sort of blow dart them. Three darts is too much. Have a great weekend, everybody. Be safe out there. And the next two sessions are going to be after spring conference. We have some spring conference sessions that are coming up uh, that we'll be part of. The next two mini sessions, we're going to be covering uh, garnishments one day and EPAR approvers the next um, one a week for a couple. So hopefully you're signed up for the ease mailing list. If not, go ahead and get signed up. I'll send the, the link out. Uh, thank you, everybody. I'll see you next time. It's one of those things where like you order from Amazon and then the vendor is like some third party vendor. And you just kind of get it when you get it. For all I know, it can be stuck in the Suez Canal with all that other crap right now. Get that boat unstuck. I need my right. my login for the Department of Revenue. Oh, crap. That guy's no longer here. Someone needs to turn his email back on. Oh, my God, Jeff. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> okay, that's that cool. <laughs> I like this one. Oh, my God. Oh. Oh, oh, this is too cool. You guys, you give you a little piece of tech. Talk. Oh, God. Pirate. There we go. Why it looks like everybody who has video is currently playing around with the filter. <laughs> 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 Let it be known that Maricopa County hires the hippest people in the land. <laughs> <laughs> nice uh, headband there, Noemi. <laughs> I'm going to leave it on the whole time. You should. You should. I think you should. I, uh...